Okay, thank you for the intervention. Okay, so you like paradoxically, if I understood well, yeah, <laughs> state intervention in this case, apart from um, being a last resource on the population and on materialization and on the materialization of the principle of solidarity in French, which we can all more or less agree that it's a good thing. Paradoxically, it ends up uh, with a lot of benefits to great power private on financialization. Mm. So it's paradoxical. Yeah. So well, both can be true. Yet yeah, it's yeah. a paradox in the yeah, sense yeah. that, yeah. yeah. So let's leave this. And then you also said that the state, uh, I think it was the first conclusion, that the state in somehow models the environmental risks yeah. as well. So that's kind of a description. Yeah. I want your opinion on a critical perspective. Mm. Is it good, is it bad, and how should it be? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent question. I, that's the picture. Yeah. Should I answer now or on prend quelques questions? Another question? Yeah. Uh, no, but on en prend plusieurs comme ça ça permet de comme tu veux. Uh, okay, um, <coughs> yeah, okay. Uh, then the um, so related to the rising payments that will have to be done because of climate breakdown and not just climate breakdown but other ecological issues. Do you think when you're considering introducing ecological taxes or carbon taxes, etc., that it could make sense to use part of that money that you earn from that explicitly to put it in a fund to pay for these disasters yeah. so that people are kind of saying, oh, okay, I'm paying, I don't know, five cent more on the petrol but that is going to come back to me if, I don't know, there's a wildfire or something like that. Probably not the best example in Paris, but somewhere <laughs> else it could be well, it more could of an floods, example. For instance. Yeah, yeah. And then kind of also by having it so explicit and kind of making people aware that the state will have to pay for this, but the state will provide kind of national solidarity, um, that could be kind of a mechanism to make these taxes on the one hand more uh, acceptable but also to, to, to get that money explicitly from the, the kind of the polluter pays principle. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you for the talk. Thank you. <laughs> I, I was just wondering, when you mentioned that argument to, for the market to take over insurance here in France, that argument that it would be better to protect the tax system in the end, it would be better fiscally, what was the counter argument to that? I was wondering because also the insurance seems not to be super complete. We saw there are pro uh, protection losses in, in on average. Um, so I was wondering if the state said it would be sh cheaper to do so, you know, or if they argued, no, there is national solidarity, what was the counter argument? Yeah. And also in line with uh, what Federico asked, I was wondering uh, where does the um, precautionary principle comes uh, within this insurance model? Because I was wondering, is this insurance model the best one to protect against um, these disasters? Or should the states like take the lead and empty up uh, some places that uh, can be riskier, riskier for floods, riskier for hurricanes? What should be the measure if it wasn't like an insurance market? If there wasn't that, how could the states tackle the risk of climate disasters? Hmm. Thank you for the interesting questions. Uh, uh, I'll start by uh, by something I wanted to say, but I didn't because for lack of time. And, and I think it answers part of your three uh, interventions. Uh, there's a debate uh, among insurers, reinsurers, and of course, of course, of also the state, which is a debate about the price signal in the context of of climate change. So imagine you're uh, living in a in a house which is uh, prone to floods. Say, it's an old house, it's your family's house, etc. 
And uh, you know you should uh, get out uh, and go and uh, live something somewhere else. Um, and the problem the state has and your insurance has is, is that, well, we live in a free country, so you basically... You so how should the state and or your insurance insurer be behave? If the insurer uh, and or the state uh, doubles your premium, would you leave? If it uh, triples your premium, would you leave, etc.? So there's work on this in uh, behavioral economics. And the answer is that mostly people don't leave. Mostly people stay. And what happens is they, that they cease to buy insurance. So they stay uninsured in flood-prone uh, areas. That's, the, that's one basic response that the state gave to SCORE in the European court, actually. That's where that happened. Uh, SCORE said, you're subsidizing risky behavior by people because the tax is so low and everyone pays for it. So what you're doing is you're inciting people to stay in houses which are danger dangerous houses. That's, that's the criticism they, they, gave, they gave against the French state and against CCR. So this is very dangerous. And they said, what we should do is reinstate the price signal and, you know, when the premiums of people is going up and up, then the people will think about it, think about their kids and whatever, or their grandchildren later when the house is theirs, and they will leave and they're going to sit there. The problem is, of course, and this is part of the, what the state uh, answered, is that if you as SCORE can select risk, that means that people, policyholders, are free not to buy insurance, because this is, again, a free market economy. You cannot have both things. You cannot at, one, at the same time select risk and, on the other hand, uh, compel people to buy insurance. This is, this, this is a contradiction in terms. So the argument of the French state is that, of course, this is, this is a risk that people will stay in their houses, but what we'll do is that we'll put in place another system which is close to, to this uh, system, which is there's something called the Fonds Barnier. So you, you all know Michel Barnier, our great European friend, uh, the, who, who, um, who managed the Brexit from on, on, the, on the European side. So he was a, a minister of, uh, not the economy, but something else, when Jacques Chirac was president, and he put in place something called the Fonds Barnier. And the Fonds Barnier is a, fa is a, is a fund that is dedicated to buying, expropriating, expropriate, expropriating houses which are uh, located in risky areas. Uh, so it, it, is, it is not through the premiums that action is taken. It's, it's through discussion with the people who are concerned with the risk and by buying uh, back the house uh, and uh, preventing other people to come. And so, so it's like a form of terminating the, terminating the market. So, so you don't leave a market for houses. You say this place is somewhere that we don't want people to buy houses or construct houses. So this is a very interesting debate because, of course, I'm, as you may have understood, I'm, I'm, in f m I'm mostly in favor of this system, I think. Of course, it benefits to big insurers, but... I would be in favor of experimenting a 100% public scheme. But the problem is that it doesn't exist anywhere, uh, to my knowledge. And uh, there, there could be also bad aspects to that 100% public scheme. So if I'm a realist and uh, I, 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 I see what's happening and what, what the, the neoliberal atmosphere is, not only in France, and, but also in other countries, I, I would say that defending the existing system is, a, is the only reasonable option we have, even if it benefits to AXA and, and other people, in my opinion. So, so I think the, government, the French government was right in defending the system. The, the main point is that th there's another uh, argument, which is the following, which was given by the French government, which is, say uh, there's a catastrophe that hits and people are not injured. So what happens is that, you know what B BFM is? BFM is the CNN, the French CNN. So BFM TV, which is the television, uh, would go there and show people in the streets without houses and having lost everything. And this would be such a scandal that anyway the government would have to do something. So at the end, someone would have to pay. In civilized countries, like they said in the litigation, we don't let people 
in the streets when a catastrophe hits. In one way or another, you help people, of course. So you better do it through a scheme that is controlled, like the Katnat regime, rather than each time that there is a catastrophe, you have to you know, take money on the state budget and all that. So, so this is another part of the, of the, of the problem I didn't talk about. But, but in this litigation, issues relating to the media were very important. Because when uh, floods hit the south of France, it's the first subject uh, on the news. So, you know, journalists with cameras going to interview people, what happened, etc. And this, of course, the government in France or anywhere else can't support the pressure uh, of not doing anything to come to the rescue of these people. So this, uh, along with the price signal, there's another debate which is media pressure on governments in the context of climate change. What, what they can do, what they can't do, uh, and this has an important influence on the insurance uh, question because, well, if you help people after the catastrophe has hit, in a sense it's, it's it's a form of insurance. It's just, uh, it's just after the fact. It's not before the fact as insurance uh, normally. You, you wanted to the say something? It was a reputational risk. For it, it was a? Uh, a reputational risk for the government. Of yeah. course, of course, of course. No government in, 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 in France especially, but in other countries as well, uh, no government uh, would risk uh, not intervening not sending a minister, not sending uh, the message that we are going to take charge. So this, this, uh, this is going to not only go on and on, but this is going to be stronger and stronger because with climate change, as we saw, there's more and more natural catastrophes of, of major implications. So this is going to be a part of our... Uh, so to come back to the issue of the state in the Anthropocene, which is one of my subjects, the state in the Anthropocene is going to be a state that is going to feel the pressure of, media, of the media very strongly because of the effects of natural catastrophes on the collective uh, consciousness of, 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 of people. So that, that's something I would say. Uh, so this answer part of the carbon tax uh, fund. Um, th this fund would... Uh, uh, I don't know if it exists somewhere. That would be an interesting experiment, I think. But uh, again, there would be no price signal because people hit, people who experience a natural catastrophe would be, uh, so this, this fund would pay the damages, so they, they would have no incentive to move, in a sense. So the question is really, when you have people living in dangerous areas, how do you, how do you convince them to go? And is it through the market mechanisms or this is this is not an easy question. I don't think the, the the fund which is you know paid by your carbon tax or the like is is able to answer the issue. I don't know. But it's an interesting experiment. I don't know of any schemes in the world who would have put in place things like that. It's very, very interesting. In Germany, it's the state budget. So when the floods hit last year, very important floods. Uh, what happened is that in the, par in the German parliament, you, you know this stuff better than I do, but in the, in the German parliament, a few weeks later, there was the voting of a fund, a specifically dedicated fund. So there's no equivalent to this, that regime in, in Germany. What happens, what the insurers have told me and the state people have told me is that whenever there's floods, there are floods in Germany, you have a delegation of German people coming to, to France to meet the people in the Ministry of Finance and of the Interior to understand how the Katnat regime works, and then they go back. And uh, apparently nothing happens. So this would be an interesting question in itself to know why in a country like Germany there's no system of that, of that kind. One answer is, the, is Munich Ray and their influence, of course. Just quickly to add... This, this issue is kind of rising on the German agenda, but it's still not really there. And for instance, Bavaria recently deleted a lot of things they would cover because of climate change. So they're just saying, oh, okay, we're not covering these floodings, we're not covering these <laughs> extreme weather events. Yeah. So basically now nobody is covered anymore. Well, because only just a couple... So they, their argument is that it's co it costs too much. To yeah, yeah. So that's kind of exactly why we wouldn't really need 
and that that's why this idea of of perhaps using something of a carbon tax for this when the state is just saying we're not covering this anymore and the insurances are basically not covering it so if it happens actually but then if it does happen in a large scale as it happened last year then again we have all the media there yeah. and we have all the chaos and then they will pay after all yeah of course but Th there's, there's no, no way they're system. not paying yeah. after the fact or before it's a Maybe one, one, one point that might be of interest. When the, the, so the, this, the, 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 the voting of this system was one of the first acts of the François Mitterrand government in 1982, precisely. And so this was the socialist government, real socialist government at the time. Uh, and what's interesting is that the right wing didn't, didn't oppose this system. They were not against the system at the time. They thought it was a great system, too. This was before the real neoliberal revolution. This was before the privatizations wave in, in France. So if you read the, the debates in the parliament about this, uh, at the time, the right-wing people were not, did not consider this to be a bad system. They, they, they thought it was OK. In fact, the mo lots of them still think it's a good one. Yeah, you know that I'm not really a provocative guy, so <laughs> if, if yes. I understand very well, you are not really in favor of, or you don't believe in a public solution, and you are more for a kind of public-private partnership. It's a conservative position, in a way. <laughs> uh, yes. the the realist one, I don't think. No, see. just a little. For now. Um, and uh, you probably know, but I'm not a specialist at all, that the state is uh, its own insurer for many things, and in particular, for the nuclear plants. Yes. Okay, and if I am right, uh, the provision for uh, a catastrophe, uh, for nuclear catastrophe in France, is 100 million euros, which means nothing. Yeah. Which completely means nothing. So, and I don't think there, I mean, there is no reinsurance, <laughs> probably. Uh, so, um, what do you think about such, it's not a natural catastrophe in that mm. case, of course, but it, it might be a, a huge catastrophe for centuries. And France is uh, kind of exposed to the, yes. this risk. And yes. I mean, 100 million. It's yes, there's, there's risk pooling about this at the European level. So there's uh, an institution, it's called, I think, in Insur Assuratum, un truc comme ça. Insur et Atom. I, we should look it up. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a form of risk pooling of all countries in Europe who have nuclear, uh, nuclear industry. Uh, I don't know the, the, the level pay, of a provision. Do we provision. pay more than the others or is it flat for us? Or? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I hope we pay more because we have many more than the others. But uh, of course, it's a, it's a great risk. Um, yeah, it's with terrorism and climate change is one of it's one of the big bigger risks. It's not necessarily the costliest ones because it's because health risk. Your friend uh, Manuel Pisson works with health, told me that uh, health is of course one of the costliest uh, uh, risks to insure, but uh, in in late capitalist societies, so so to speak. But uh, no, I, I don't know much about. Uh, about this, this form of insurance. All I know is that there's some form of risk pooling at the European level, and which, which go back, back, goes back to the 60s, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. But, but in that case, it's really a political issue because, I mean, uh, the cost of nuclear energy uh, within the mix uh, is not the same. In the case, you, are, you have the, the state as its own insurer for just a few hundreds millions, or if the real cost of this insurance is put on the table. I mean, it's, uh, it's a... Yeah, I, I asked this question uh, to a guy of uh, EDF, a hiring guy. He, he, said, he said to me, we don't do risk management. We don't do risk management. So they're not allowed to take any risks, that's the argument. So we don't need insurance because we don't do risk management. But of course, you, you have to count on the fact that there's nothing, that nothing is going to happen. He really said that. This was someone pretty high in the, in the EDF hierarchy. So, so it Hopefully he's right. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I was very intrigued, but I actually never heard before about those reinsuring companies. Yeah. Like those big global Fascinating ones. companies. Fascinating, a little scary too. So scary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question is a good little bit going in that direction. Like in a system like the UK, when it's all privatized, what happens to the power relations? Because suddenly you have like some like privatized global institution is taking on a like social function on a large scale. Like, do you know anything about like the background workings? If there is like, I don't know, like there must be something. I, at least I would try to exploit my position if I was like Munich or however the companies were called. Um, you mean in power relations? In general, in the political system, for instance, in France, or you mean on no, no, the like regulation in of insurance? In, in, a, in a privatized system where yeah. like all this risk is taken on by the global yeah. reinsurers, like yeah. is there any like way how they try to like impose themselves on like legislation or something? Like they, they must be doing some lobbying to like have influence on the spaces that they have so much investment in. Yeah, I don't know much about that. I don't know much about that. There should be. Um, I'm trying to think about uh, uh, an example. You know something about it? Uh, I just know that, of course, that they're going to be doing lobbying because they just have such large amounts of money flowing around. And there's an interest there. What's interesting is that Munich Re actually, I'm not going to defend like they're not a brilliant company, but they really noticed climate change is destroying our business because as a like reinsurer, their biggest disaster is if they cannot like all their things go off the chart, all their the, the likelihood of all their disasters they're insuring is so much higher that they will not be able to make a profit. So in a, in a somewhat interesting way, these kind of reinsurers could be allies in capital, which are starting to talk about climate more because they know that that's their business ruined. But they also definitely are doing loads of other shady things at the same time where they can get more money. But that I just found very interesting. I think the main thing they do is what Daniela Gabor calls de-risking, which is w another way to s talk about socializing risk. That is asking the state to subsidize premiums or to compel people to... I think that would be the main activity they do. Uh, from that point of view, SCORE's position is a bit um, related to a previous period of the history of neoliberalism, which is the, 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 the say, high neoliberalism of the 90s, where you ask for more and more privatization, etc. But Gabor's argument is that we, we are no longer in that, of course, privatizations exist, etc. But what financial capital does today, this is what she calls the Wall Street consensus, is ask for uh, uh, safe assets, etc. So de-risking. And this goes also for the construction of an insurance and reinsurance premium. So in cases where uh, reinsurers are, um, are so dominant, I don't know, I, w we would have to study the, the German case more closely, but through European legislation, I think what they would do is, in a sense, what the French state has done with the Catnat regime. This is a... This is a, this is a this is a good how should I say that? Then? Of course, you could always ask for more profits and more privatizations, but in the context of, um, comment dit incertitude déjà? Uncertainty. uncertainty, sorry. <laughs> in the context of growing uncertainty with climate change, exactly, that's the problem. You don't know in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, how many natural catastrophes you will have to ensure. There's a great uncertainty on what is going to happen. And in a context of rising uncertainty, it seems to me that the strategy of de-risking, socializing risk, is the rational strategy from, from the point of view of it. So the score's position is a bit funny in this context, because what they ask for, of course they would select risk, but what they ask for basically is more and more privatization. They, they, they want the state to get out of the business of insuring climate risk. So this is a bit... A, a, a bit uh, specific to France position that maybe they, I don't know I don't know I, I couldn't of course uh, uh, listen to the internal debates of these people that would be the most interesting I do interviews with them and of course when I do interviews with them they tell me what they want to tell me I try to you know uh, know as much as I can but 
the internal debates of a company like Munich Re or AXA, etc. I know that AXA has been fluctuating a bit about its support for the system. This, this has to do with, with many issues, but uh, among them, the fact that AXA today um, uh, considers that it could prosper in a, in a private system where it could select risk and it doesn't need the state anymore to back its climate risk business. So I know there's some hesitations in, in big companies like that. But until now, for, including for political purposes, the, what I've heard is that Macron has been able to convince them to stay in the system, but he gave them something else uh, instead, which is a part of the retirement system and uh, uh, reform that's going to take place in the second part of it after 2022. So it's a don non as we say in France. So uh, you stay in the system for CatNAT, and I'll give you something else on, uh, on, on the privatized system of, of retirement. But it's a good question. I don't have, I don't have the answer to that question. Should, we sh I, I haven't investigated fully a, a countries where you know, they're fully, fully private systems of climate risk. Any other questions? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Thank you.